So hello everyone, my name's Ellie. Um, I'm an F2 currently working down in Devon in A&E and thank you for all attending this session this evening. This is Gastroenterology Part 1 as part of the Finals Crash Course series. Um, we will be recording the session and uploading it onto YouTube um, by tomorrow. And then also, um, if I can ask you to either scan this QR code or follow the link, um, and that's how we'll be answering the questions today. I'll give you a moment to do that. Please also pop any extra questions you have into the chat. Um, I've got that open as well, so we'll be able to answer those. All right, so let's make a start with the first question. So um, we've got a 52 year old man who's got a history of a chronic bowel disease, high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. And he comes to A&E with abdominal pain, itching of his skin and feeling very tired. And you notice that he has got jaundice sclera and you examine his abdomen and he's got palpable hepatomegaly. So what type of jaundice based on his background do you think this patient is most likely to have? And the polls are open for that one. OK, so give that a couple of minutes. So we've had a spread of answers between B and C. The answer I was going for this time was B and we'll explain why. So firstly, just an overview of jaundice. So you can divide it broadly into pre, intra and post hepatic causes. People tend to have visibly jaundice sclera when their bilirubin gets to about 50. And um, just a quick refresher that prehepatic causes are anything that involves excess hemolysis and this overwhelms the liver's ability to conjugate bilirubin. So you get a predominantly unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. In intrahepatic causes, so it's damage to the liver itself. So it's mainly unconjugated because the liver, because it's now damaged, is, is not able to conjugate. However, um, if a liver is cirrhotic, there may also be a degree of obstructive um, picture in there. So you can get this mixed picture. And then post-hepatic, so due to obstruction, usually in the biliary tree somewhere, um, you get a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And what I was kind of going for with this patient is um, the chronic bowel disease could point towards him possibly having sort of PSC um, and this can cause sort of damage and and I can see why someone put C because yes it can it predominantly affects the the biliary tract but that in itself the blockage that causes actually leads to liver damage which is his sort of presenting complaint here and people tend to present with an intrahepatic type picture in that case. So here's sort of a broad overview of some of the causes. Um, Gilbert syndrome as a prehepatic cause is quite interesting these people tend to get um, sort of an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in response to sort of an acute illness. Um, and then intrahepatic causes um, involve hepatitis and that's all the different you know types of hepatitis, viral, um, alcoholic, autoimmune, um, liver cancers and PVC or PSC, uh, which in its initial instance causes sort of liver damage. And then post hepatic causes include blockages directly of the biliary tree. So things like pancreatic or biliary masses uh, and then obviously gallstones or gallstone sludge. And then LFTs. So for your exams, it's just worth remembering that ALT is the marker of a liver damage itself. So um, sometimes you'll see, you know, numbers given out in textbooks of you know, it's got to be 10 times the amount of this, but but predominantly if you've got a big ALT rise compared to the ALP, this suggests a liver damage. Um, ALP, if that is particularly risen, that's a marker of cholestasis. 
um, and that suggests some sort of obstructive picture. ALP risen in isolation is a marker of other things as well. So things like bone damage, uh, fractures, cancers, or vitamin D deficiency. GGT, we don't often include that on a routine panel of uh, liver function tests, but you can add it sort of, it's raised in response to alcohol, or if it's together with a raised ALP, it again suggests a cholestatic picture. And then bilirubin, um, you know, you've got to interpret bilirubin in, in, in keeping with everything else that is going on. Um, an isolated rise may suggest Gilbert's or hemolysis. INR, um, you know, we could talk about sort of liver function as a whole thing of its own, but ideally INR should be under one unless they're anticoagulated. Um, and if that is, is high and they're not anticoagulated, we're thinking about, um, you know, the liver losing its synthetic function. And then albumin, so lots of causes for low albumin, um, not all necessarily specifically liver pathology. People, if they've got a systemic inflammatory response or problems with their kidneys, such as nephrotic syndrome, can have low albumin, um, but it's also associated with cirrhosis. OK, so we've got the second question. So a 21 year old man this time comes to A&E with nausea and vomiting. He's visibly jaundiced and he feels itchy. He's usually fit and well, and he admits um, that he's been engaging in high risk, unprotected sex recently. Um, he's also concerned because his flatmate has got food poisoning type symptoms. He thinks it's related to that. What sort of virus do we think is most likely to be causing his symptoms? OK, so predominantly um, people have actually gone for for B here. But the, the thing that I was aiming at was was number C, um, hepatitis B. So um, the reason for that is, um, yes, you're right. HIV is associated with unprotected sex, but wouldn't necessarily present with jaundice. Um, it sort of more often presents with recurrent infections or sort of, you know, that a person who should otherwise be fit and well getting these quite serious or abnormal infections um but this um man are always thinking about hepatitis d so hepatitis is just a broad term for liver inflammation um, as you know there's lots of different causes or types of hepatitis and um, there's alcohol or drug induced or toxin induced uh, inflammation of the liver you can have autoimmune hepatitis which is um sort of a lot rarer but it you know if you've got a patient that you can't find a cause for their hepatitis in their history, often you end up running extra tests that will um, look into the autoimmune side of things. Uh, viral hepatitis, so as a bit of a review, um, hepatitis A is associated with food poisoning. Uh, hepatitis B is associated with high risk sexual behavior, IVDU um, and pass between mother to baby um, in a lot of low middle income countries. And it's got, the thing about hepatitis B to remember is that it has a high chronicity in childhood. So I think the stats are something like um, if an adult is exposed to hepatitis B, only 20 percent of those people will become chronic. So obviously they're not vaccinated. Um, if it's the other way around, if it's a child, they have about 80 percent chance of it becoming a chronic infection. Hepatitis C is predominantly associated with sharing needles um, or tattoos uh, in risky places um, and to a lesser extent is associated with sexual activity. Hepatitis D you can only catch if you have also got hepatitis B and hepatitis E is also associated with food poisoning and the key thing to remember with that is that it's very dangerous in pregnant women can make them very unwell. Okay so We've got this lady who is 45 and she has brought to A&E with severe vomiting and abdominal pain for 24 hours. 
She's clammy. She's got severe pain in the epigastric region radiating to her back. And she's got past medical history of biliary colic, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. What's the most useful imaging to do for this lady? First line. <clears throat> okay so it's also an interesting one so you might have some some disagreement here I can see why so what I was actually going for was a CT majority of people have spoken about ultrasound which yes I, I can see where you're coming from she's got a background of biliary colic this may well be um sort of you know a gallstone type picture but the key thing that would lean towards a CT it, rather than an ultrasound in sort of clinical practice if you saw this patient in A&E she's got pain sort of radiating into her back and that of course in an emergency setting can point to other things so it's quite unlikely because of her age but you want to think about um, particularly in older patients things like triple A's or you know the vomiting the abdominal pain points towards more of a pancreatitis picture which is what I'm kind of going for here so acute pancreatitis is a disorder of the exocrine pancreas so it's release of pancreatic enzymes that actually are sort of auto digesting the pancreas itself um, and it causes local and systemic inflammation CT is the most useful imaging modality for pancreatitis. So yes, this lady may have gallstones, which would be good to get an ultrasound of. She may well end up having an ultrasound while she's in hospital, but this really is going to tell you what's causing this pain. Um, and here is the I get smashed, um, which is a great one to remember for your exams. Gallstones are the most common cause of pancreatitis in the UK, followed by alcohol. And we've also got lots of other weird and wonderful causes um a lot of cases are idiopathic and we don't really know why they get pancreatitis um things like trauma um particularly there's been some cases in children which have been reported recently where they get sort of a blow to the to the abdomen sort of falling on something or you know coming off their bike or that kind of thing um to be aware of things like steroids mumps autoimmune disease a particular type of scorpion uh, which everyone likes to remember um high triglycerides having a recent ERCP or certain drugs okay so this one so we've got this man who's 83 and he is undergoing uh, chemo for pancreatic cancer and he's come into a &E with vomiting He's also on the questioning, he's not opened his bowels for a couple of days and he can't really remember about whether he's passed wind or not. And examining him, he's cachectic, um, his abdomen's descended, he looks mildly jaundiced. So um, this CT, what do you think this shows? <clears throat> okay great so we've got a range of answers for this one um it's actually c so um i think it probably would have been more impressive if i'd shown you um sort of the image looking straight on but he has got a massive stomach that massive um, thing that you can see there uh, is his stomach and actually it's so big that that sort of fluid level you can see on the other side as well is, is also stomach it's just so big um, and that is because he's got gastric outlet obstruction um, the 
I, A, maybe was a little bit mean, like, yes, this probably indicates progression of malignancy, but the actual thing that we're seeing on this slice of the scan is the gastric outlet obstruction. So pancreatic cancer, um, I just talk briefly about surgical management and then other um, things that we can do as well. So unfortunately, it's often diagnosed at a late stage. Patients may not be suitable candidates for surgery if it's metastasized. Um, or even, you know, some local spread into lymph nodes, they don't qualify for surgery because it's already, um, you know, we know the cancer is quite aggressive. It's a big, big surgery with a high mortality rate. So they're very selective about who um, is, is uh, eligible to have a Whipple's procedure. Um, some presenting features of pancreatic cancer include obstructive jaundice, um, usually painless, um, you know, painless palpable gallbladder um, called Bosnia's law is, is something obstructing um, until proven otherwise. So you can get abdominal pain that radiates into the back. You can have weight loss. Sometimes patients also develop new onset uh, diabetes as well as another one to think about. So consider curative surgery in patients with stage one or two disease. And this means that their tumours confines the pancreas. There's no blood vessel invasion and there's a, no more than three lymph nodes involved. And a Whipple's procedure is this little diagram here. And as you can see, it's a massive operation um, and it's got about 15 percent mortality rate just from the operation alone. Um, if someone's not suitable, we can think about palliative interventions. So you can have stenting um, to, to give sort of symptom relief or sometimes they do bypass surgery. Uh, to bypass a blocked bit of duodenum um, if the person's got more than a six month prognosis and a reasonable functional baseline. Okay, so uh, question five. So this man has got um, excessive burping. He's feeling full early after meals and he's had rapid weight loss over the last two months. And he has an OGD and this biopsy is taken from his stomach. And the pictures uh, there are seen under the microscope. What sort of diagnosis do we think this is? OK, great. So we've got a bit of a, an even split again there between A and B. So the answer is B. So this is a type of adenocarcinoma. Can anyone um, sort of pop in the chat what sort of adenocarcinoma this is? It's got kind of a, a histological term that we that we use for it. Yes, that's brilliant. So Osama's got it there. So it's the signet ring adenocarcinoma. Um, so that's a type of gastric cancer. So gastric cancer generally is the fifth most common cancer worldwide. 90% uh, of, of gastric cancers are adenocarcinomas and 10% are other types of cancer, just lymphoma, um, lymph, um, carcinoid tumours, that kind of thing. Um, signet ring adenocarcinoma is a particular sort and you can see if we just go back to this picture um i feel like you have to sort of use your imagination quite uh, wildly for this but if you look at the little rings that are formed there you could almost imagine that they look like um you know a ring with gemstone um that's you know supposedly um but anyway signet ring cancer is a very uh, aggressive and it's very high grade and it's often spread quite widely at diagnosis so it's got poor prognosis. Risks for gastric cancer include H. pylori infection, uh, being male, uh, being older and smoking and it often presents with these vague non-specific symptoms so um, 
problems with feeling full early, feeling sick, um, lots of sort of burping and indigestion type symptoms. And often that's why people don't go and get it checked out because, you know, indigestion, people don't always take very seriously. Um, and some sort of signs of a late stage cancer would be feeling a palpable mass in the left of the quadrant or trussia sign, which is this um, supraclavicular node that you feel um, on the left side. And for proximal cancers, uh, we can do a Rouen Y total gastrectomy uh, for the best outcome. And distal cancers, you can sometimes get away with just a subtotal gastrectomy. OK, so number six, we've got a 54 year old man who's got a long standing history of uh, gastroesophageal reflux and he is diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus. Which of the following statements about Barrett's esophagus are true? <clears throat> okay, great. So um, the answer is actually E. So quite a few people said B. So Barrett's is not dysplasia, Barrett's is metaplasia, and we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and I think someone was also mentioning C. Um, unfortunately, Barrett's doesn't resolve, um, even if you treat the reflux, once you've got the metaplasia there. Um, you either need to resect it endoscopically, um, but you do need to keep an eye on it. And it's usually every two to five years. And if all we see is metaplasia, so metaplasia being a change in the type of cell, but it's not necessarily a cancerous cell. However, if you see any dysplasia, so cells that are showing uh, features of malignancy, then we need to treat that. So the difference between Barrett's and, and esophageal cancer. So Barrett's is considered to be a pre-cancerous condition because you've got this change in cell type uh, metaplasia, which has a potential for dysplasia. And you can see on the, the photo below there, um, the esophageal mucosa should be this squamous epithelium. It's kind of a light pink. And then you've got this columnar epithelium, which is technically stomach epithelium coming up. Um, and it's a form of protection, really. Um, from all the acid that's there, the body is sort of trying to protect that by um, growing an epithelium that is built to deal with uh, that acid damage. However, over time, that predisposes to cancerous change. So if the person sort of scoped every two to five years, and if they find some dyspl dysplastic cells, then we now manage this with endoscopic mucosal resection. And this saves the person having to go through an esophagectomy, which is what we used to do. And obviously is a, a lot, lot more invasive and a lot more complications. Um, any features of cancer, so things like weight loss or rapidly progressing dysphagia um, need to be obviously investigated promptly. Um, the difference, you'll see quite a lot of patients that have dysphagia, um, but sometimes, you know, dysphagia can be um, there's a condition called achalasia, which is a problem with the, the muscles in the lower part of the esophagus. That tends to present with sometimes people have problems with food, sometimes it's, it's liquids and it's kind of a mix of both. In a cancer type picture, if, if you imagine you've got a narrowing there, so it will progress from initially it will be food, then it will be liquid um, and it happens typically over a few weeks uh, to, to months at most. So squamous cell carcinoma is the most common worldwide type of esophageal cancer. Um, and it's typically sort of mid to upper third of the esophagus and it's associated with smoking and alcohol. That's often managed first with chemo radiotherapy. Adenocarcinoma is more common in the UK and that's a consequence of this Barrett's change often. Um, and risks include long standing gourd and high fat diets. Um, and that is managed by neoadjuvant chemo 
with esophagectomy. Red flags for scoping somebody um, over 55 with weight loss and upper abdominal pain or any person with progressive dysphagia, um, even if they're younger than 55. Okay, so next uh, we've got this lady who is 34. She is, uh, she's had three days of diarrhea and intermittent bloody stools. She's got a fever and a high heart rate. She's usually well, she takes no regular medication. Uh, examining her, she's obese. She has tenderness and guarding in the left iliac fossa. And she's got mildly raised inflammatory markers with no other uh, abnormalities on her blood tests. What would we most likely see on colonoscopy for this lady? Okay, great. So, um, so the answer I was going for here is actually D, which I think a couple of you did get. Um, I can see again why people went for B. We'll come on to that. So the condition that I'm aiming at here is diverticulitis. And actually in med school, I think we're taught that diverticulitis is an older person's disease. But now having um, sort of been in clinical practice on a gastro ward in A&E, there's a lot of young people in their 30s and 40s getting diverticulitis. And it's usually because of a, you know, a low quality diet, um, you know, obesity being a factor in that. Um, and this lady's symptoms, um, the mucosal ulceration, of course, would be in keeping with ulcerative colitis. But this lady's only had three days of her diarrhoea. Um, she's usually well. For ulcerative colitis, we probably expect sort of a longer history of intermittent bleeding and diarrhea, whereas this patient has got just three days of the, the diarrhea with infective type symptoms, which in keeping with diverticulitis. So it's related to a low fibre diet um, and it's these small little outpouchings in the colon, most common in the sigmoid colon, and they get impacted with stool. And then that can lead to infection, inflammation and possible perforation. So if we see someone who has got some mild abdominal pain, some mildly raised inflammatory markers, we can sometimes just treat them with oral antibiotics. We can even send them home from hospital um, with strong safety net advice to return if things get worse. However, if they've got high inflammatory markers or any signs of perforation, so localised peritonism or worse, generalised peritonism, we're going to need to get them an urgent CT, bring them into hospital. Um, diverticulitis can also lead to abscess formation. That's usually where a diverticulum has perforated and that's sealed itself off. Um, and then that collection of infection becomes an abscess. Under five centimetres, this can be often treated conservatively with antibiotics, but if they're larger than this, they often require IR guided drainage or even um, resections. We do Hartman's procedures, for example, for diverticular disease. And complications of recurrent um, diverticulitis include things like fistulas um, and strictures as well of the affected bit of bowel. And <coughs> hinge classification is how we think about diverticulitis severity as seen on CT. So stage one um, are types of abscesses. Stage two is an abscess, but it's walled off. Um, type three is peritonitis with pus and type four is fecal peritonitis. OK, so question eight. 27 year old patient who has a history of inflammatory bowel disease attends A&E uh, and she's got uh, episodes of bloody diarrhea 10 times a day. She's got a fever. She's tachycardic. She's lost four kilos in weight over the last few months. What scoring system is used to assess 
a flare of ulcerative colitis. Okay, great. So everyone got this one. So true love and wits is um, is one we're looking for. Blatchford and Rockall scores are related to upper GI bleeding. Glasgow Imri is to do with pancreatitis. So inflammatory bowel disease um, includes Crohn's disease and these patients are often younger and um, they present with non-specific symptoms which can include any part of the GI tract in younger children, sort of pre-puberty, it can stunt their growth. And there's a higher incidence of surgery uh, than patients with UC, which obviously makes sense, I suppose, because it's different parts of their, you know, their whole GI tract that can be affected. UC predominantly prevents with PR bleeding and diarrhea. Um, it's usually over a few months of, of on and off episodes. Um, and the disease progresses around the colon, so it always starts at the rectum and it makes its way round in a stepwise fashion. There's no gaps. True love and wits is used to assess the severity of a flare of UC. And for both Crohn's and colitis, the stepwise treatment includes five ASAs, which are things like mesalazine, um, azathioprine, steroids, and then later on, um, immunosuppressants, things like biologics. Patients, if they're acutely unwell um, with a flare up, they're often brought into hospital and they're given treatment with IV steroids and IV immunomodulators. So cyclosporin used to be used more, that's sort of quite a toxic drug. Um, now patients are often started on a biologic um, in a severe flare, so things like infliximab, and then surgical options if these drugs fail. And the features there, um, a useful table um, online. So UC, as we've mentioned, starts at the rectum and works its way round. Crohn's can appear in any part of the GI tract. In ulcerative colitis, the inflammation is confined to the mucosa, whereas in Crohn's disease, it's often throughout the layers of the bowel. Microscopic changes. In UC, we see crypt abscesses, left goblet cells, and um, there's no granulomas whereas Crohn's disease typically forms granulomas. And the changes that we see on colonoscopy, so you see, you might see pseudopolyps, ulcers, continuous inflammation, and then Crohn's disease, we get what's called skip lesions. So there's areas of healthy bowel in between sections of inflamed bowel. There's fissures, deep ulcers, which can be described as a cobblestone appearance, and they can form fistulas as well. And then here is, um, some types of surgery for UC and Crohn's. So often um, in UC, if a person is acutely unwell, they will have a subtotal colectomy leaving the rectum in place and an end ileostomy. Uh, and the reason for that is removing the rectum uh, is quite time consuming. The person's under anaesthetic for you know many hours. And if they're unwell at the time, this isn't always an option. Then we go back and remove the rectum at a planned elective date when they're more well. So when they've had the subtotal colectomy, the options from there are either they can have their rectum removed and they have a permanent ileostomy, or they can have the rectum removed and they can have a pouch that's made out of their small bowel, which avoids the need for a stoma. Crohn's disease, um, there's obviously types of resection for particularly damaged areas of bowel. Um, but we also do things like strictoplasty, so opening uh, strictures to preserve the bowel. Um, okay, so uh, number nine, so this man um, is 30 and he presents with anal pain and bright red bleeding um, after opening his bowels. He's recently been constipated. And on examination, he has a small skin defect in the six o'clock position, which is not currently bleeding. And what's the most appropriate initial treatment for him?
Okay, great. So um, most of you got that one. So conservative measures. So this uh, patient has got an anal fissure. Um, so ligation banding would be for hemorrhoids. GTN would be for a fissure if conservative measures um, and stool softeners haven't worked. And then setons are used for fistulas. So types of uh, anal lesions that we see commonly. So a fissure, a patient will describe a sharp pain that's associated with a bowel movement. It's often bright red blood on the tissue as they're wiping um, and it's associated with being constipated and straining. And management includes conservative, so things like eating more fibre, um, drinking more fluid, advising patients not to spend too long on the toilet, so that discourages them from straining. If that doesn't work, you can try stool softeners like Senna uh, or topical GTN. And if all of that fails, we can do um, a small procedure um, called an internal sphincterotomy. A fistula is associated with, with IBD um, and it often involves sort of leakage from the anus and looking at the skin, you might be able to see a very small defect there. Sometimes these fistulas get um, infected and that it can be associated with abscesses and that would include a painful fluctuant mass. And the treatment for those are drainage of any abscesses, a fistulotomy in a second. So you can cut a fistula open, which sort of sounds counterproductive, but actually allows it to heal by secondary intention. Um, and a set on is just like a little string that we put in uh, that forces the trap to stay open. And that again, encourages healing by secondary intention. Hemorrhoids, so we can grade hemorrhoids from one to four from being just visible, um, but not actually, you know, once someone's opened their bowels, they're visible at that point, and then they go back inside. Grade four, they're outside and they don't reduce. Um, and often patients will present to A&E with grade four hemorrhoids because the pain is just so severe. But unfortunately, if you've got hemorrhoids that are uh, not reducible, we can't band those and we can't remove those, um, which often really upsets people, understandably. But actually, the fact that they're outside of the anus, they are effectively banded themselves. So that patient will have pain for a few days and we can give them treatment for that. But the hemorrhoids will actually sort of die off themselves. Um, so before they get to that point, treatment that we can do, uh, again, conservative measures, uh, topical anesthesia and creams. And then after that, if they're reducible, but causing symptoms, we can band them or freeze them. And this, I believe, is my last question for the evening. So we've got a frail 92 year old who comes in with vomiting, abdominal pain, and she's not opened her bowels for four days. And she's not passing wind. And this is her x-ray. So what is the most appropriate management for her? Okay, great. So I think everyone got that one. So yeah, so it is indeed a flatus tube insertion and this is a typical picture of a sigmoid volvulus. So the presentation often tends to be a distended abdomen, nausea and vomiting, and bowels not open and not passing wind. Clinical signs, um, we've mentioned abdominal distension, bowel sounds tend to be high pitched and there's an empty rectum usually on PR. And um, these patients might get rushed for a CT in, in reality, but actually an X-ray um, and that that we call the coffee bean sign there 
is diagnostic of a volvulus, a sigmoid volvulus. Um, and the treatment for this is to firstly keep the patient nil by mouth. If they're vomiting, we might insert a Ryles tube. We can give them antiemetics, analgesia, and then we can insert this rigid flatus tube, which um, decompresses um, and helps to untwist the bowel. And it's particularly good in elderly patients who are sort of not suitable for surgical intervention. But be aware if they've got, you know, if they've had these symptoms for several days, they've not been to hospital for whatever reason, um, and there's any degree of ischemia, which we might see on a raised lactate, we've got to be careful about um, treating with a flatus tube and potentially untwisting compromised bowel. So um, sometimes one of the options which nobody picked um, was A, so palliation. So I have seen in practice now, if you've got a patient who is very, very severely frail, or they've got a severe cognitive impairment and, and using a flatus tube is going to be distressing, sometimes we do palliate patients with, with volvulus. And also being aware um, of risk of perforation and sepsis and correcting any electrolyte imbalances due to their vomiting. So that's the end of my talk today. So gastro is a huge topic to cover. So we will be doing some more sessions. Uh, this was only part one. So we'll be doing more sessions uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, please fill out the feedback form and then we can send you a copy of the slides for your revision. Thank you very much.